good. Okay. Hi. Today, I'm very, very excited to have my college mate, Lorna Owen Jones, on this um, little video with me, this little interview with me today to talk about vetting. She, we qualified together back in 2004 from the Royal Vet College. And uh, since then, she has also opened her own practice uh, called Pinfold Vets, a very successful small animal practice. And today we're just going to talk about a little bit of her, about her journey. So Lorna, welcome. Hi Lennon, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. Better after seeing you, better after seeing you. It's all good. <laughs> Let's just get right into it. Can we just start with the first basic question? Why do you want to become a vet? You know, I'm not sure. I just always grew up wanting to be a vet. And I don't know. I, I just, for as long as I can remember, I always wanted to be a vet. And I, I'm not sure I even knew why. I guess I had a, a, a love of animals. And um, I've, all, I've always loved animals. I was horse mad when I was younger. And, um, and even dogs and things. We never had a dog when I was young. So I'd go and walk everybody else's dogs and things. And um, I just liked working with animals and it was just, it always seemed to be on my radar as what I wanted to do. And in fact, I ended up quite nearly missing out and not ending up being a vet for various various reasons to do with school grades and things like that. Well, and um, when you, I mean, well, I'm glad we became a vet, that's why we became friends, so that's very, very good. Um, when you were in college, in a Royal Vet College, you know, what challenges do you feel you face in college? Well, I, I've, I face a number because I was really, um, same as you, I was older than most of the other, other students because I did a degree beforehand. So everybody knows you need really good grades to get into vet school um, at A-level. And unfortunately, I didn't have those. So uh, my dream of becoming a vet was put on hold for a bit. And I went off to do um, another course on equine studies, which is the study of horses. It was a degree course. And um, from the I was um, doing research and things and, and I was working at the vet school in Edinburgh um, and that sort of reignited my passion and made me realise that actually I could go to vet school. So um, I'm, I reapplied and got in on the basis of my degree but that meant that when I got to, to vet college I was with lots of other people who were um, you know a few years younger than me but I also felt quite um, intimidated and whether I would cope intellectually because I didn't have these amazing A-level grades. Um, so I think the age difference was something as well because I was um, in my early 20s rather than my late teens. And then also feeling that um, I almost felt a bit of a fraud, I think, for being there, that I wasn't quite sure whether I, um, I deserved the place because all these people have these brilliant A-level grades and I'd, I'd um, sort of scrapes in um, on the basis of a degree. So but were you already having, in, that. Yeah, were you already having imposter syndrome back in vet college? I mean, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from that, which I can totally appreciate, um, what other challenges do you feel you felt? Um, I think financial challenges, um, I had to find my own funding for the degree. So um, that really only came together after I had a place. And I was, and I very much, it was year by year of how I was going to get by financially. And um, how have we been qualified? Um, how many years now? 2016 years. 16 years, yeah. I'm still, I'm still paying back a student loan. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I mean, it's fine and I could afford to do it and I'm glad I did it, but, um, and I was very lucky to find funding, but I had to sit and write a lot of letters um, and beg, beg and I was going to say steal them, but I, I didn't resort to stealing, <laughs> but I had to beg and write a lot of letters to, to on some funds to see if um, I could get money from them to fund the course. Did you have to uh, take up part-time jobs as well when you were... Yeah, I worked a lot during college. I always had a job. Um, so in, I think in the first couple of years, I worked at, um, in the city, um, in one of the, the pubs in the city, and, um, and I continued to work basically throughout. And in summer holidays and things like that, I, I was always working and doing something. No, I, I, can, uh, I can totally relate to that because uh, probably like yourself, I was also paying the full tuition fees. Mm. Uh, Singapore and I always had pretty much three jobs on the go uh, and uh, you know du during the holidays I had to move out to save rent and things like that so I can appreciate what well, well done and I'm glad that you know we persist and, yeah uh, I don't know I, 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 I like to think that because of that extra bit that we had to undergo 
um, I think we gain a bit more from college than just going straight from A levels, but that's just a yeah. I mean, I feel that as well, and I think you know it's interesting that you and I have both become practice owners, and there's a you know a few others as well. We're not in a you know, um, but I do think we're perhaps because we face those early challenges. Um, you know, we have we're sort of a bit more robust in thinking well and a bit more bullish that I want to do. Don't let things stop us because we have, you know, we we have done that. So um, I think it's all all character building. And in a way, I'm glad I got. I'm glad I went the route I did because I think those extra few years of maturity really helps as well. Um, particularly when we graduated, because I actually went into my first job with a colleague from vet school as well. Um, and because I looked old and nobody knew that I was a new graduate, so people said that they didn't want to see the new vet, the young the young vet. <laughs> Which, but they come and see me because they, they didn't realise that I was just out of college too. Well done. Um, Sorry, I'm just uh, shushing the children. That's all right. Uh, this is this is going to be edited anyway, so no, no <laughs> one. <laughs> well, thanks for doing this, by the way, Alon. I, I, I know it's I that's all right. Um, let's expand a little bit more on that. So you're talking about being bullish and robust to be able to, one of the traits to open a practice. Let's talk a little bit more about open and practice. What made you want to go along the lines of to start a practice? That is quite a big jump from what we learn in college to be a vet. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the what was really surprising is that um, I did it when I just had a second baby as well. So I set up literally having this small newborn baby and then actually we opened the month after his first birthday. So um, looking back now, I think that's absolutely crazy, but it seemed to work at the time. But um, I always wanted my own practice. In fact, I was looking at our yearbook um, from vet school and my um, the, the comment about where do you see yourself in 10 years time was um, with my old and knackered with my own thriving practice. So I kind of um, have got there. But then I went to work for one of the big animal charities and um, and really got quite involved there. And, but went sort of higher at the management ladder, leading the teams at hospitals, I absolutely loved it. And then there was a big restructure. Um, a lot of my people that had mentored me throughout my career had left. I didn't feel as well supported and, um, and there were quite a few changes just before I went off on maternity leave for the second time. And I ended up not getting a role that, um, that I'd really wanted, um, which actually would have involved me leaving clinical work. So I'm glad that I didn't, didn't get it. Um, and then, I, um, I came off on maternity leave to have a think about what I was going to do. I thought about working part time as a vet and, you know, doing something else. And it was actually um, someone that worked for my husband said, why doesn't she set up a practice in the village? It needs a really good vet. Um, so I said, well, you know, that's, that's bonkers. I've just got, you know, two children. I, I can't do that. And I had a chat. My husband had his own practice at the, at the time. And, you know, I said, I just don't think that's going to be doable. You and I both work in running practices. And I hummed and hard. And, um, and in the end, I, I just didn't know what to do. And he said, well, put it this way. He said, if you don't set up, somebody else probably will. So how will you feel if you have to drive past it every day? I can't do that. <laughs> I can totally appreciate that. There's a quote I heard, you know, hell on earth is meeting the person that you wanted to be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that was it, that was it then. And that, but that was such a simple question. It, um, and psychologically, it's just such a simple question that you just have to ask yourself it. Whereas I've been rounding circles, you know, do I have the time? Do I have the energy? Do I have the resources? Could I do it? But actually the question was to ask is, is can I not do it? And how would I feel if somebody else does it? Um, so that's, and then um, I, I knew I didn't want to do it on my own. Um, I think that would have been too much to do as a sole owner, which you've done. Um, and I had, um, obviously we've got friends at Abetz and um, there's someone that I work with that I knew I, I got on well with. We're quite opposite. Um, I, I approached him to see if he was interested and he went from there. Mm, good. Well done. Um, let's backtrack a little bit to just after college. I'm just interested. How did you feel? college prepared you for working life? Do you feel is well prepared or not so much? I, I mean, what, what were your thoughts after you qualified and you started working? Do you feel like, you know, I've got this, I went to college or was it tricky? Or 
What, 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 I, mean, what I, think, I think we learn a lot academically, and I have to say that, um, you know, I think I'm a good first, first opinion vet. Um, I think we come out with a lot of knowledge we don't necessarily need, and I actually think that probably something that stood me in good stead for my first jobs was actually all the other jobs I'd done in customer service roles and things like that. Mm came out equipped with the with the, the relevant knowledge but there was probably a lot of extra knowledge that I didn't feel I needed and um, and I think I think rotations in the final year were really helpful um, and I, I really thrived at those and I think that was that was the thing for me that's where I sort of found my feet and um, so I think that prepared as well and I'm lucky that as I say I went into work with somebody else that graduated at the same time as me and so we were able to um, sort of support each other in our first job so I, I enjoyed my first job but it does take um you know now looking back it takes I think it takes a good 10 years to really be completely comfortable with what you're doing really sort of own it um, I look at a lot of the graduates you know new graduates stressing they're coming out and you can't and they wonder why they sort of feel stressed and it is just a process I think you have to go through that to 10 years you will be able to do a lot of it just you know off you'll be able to be a good vet off pat because you've done it for so long it's like mm -hmm. things yeah yeah uh, i sort of uh, i can sort of mirror your image as well let's talk about your practice so mm -hmm. what challenges did you face starting a practice one of the biggest things was finding a premises because um, I was adamant um, the location we wanted to be in. Um, we live in a big village that's getting significantly bigger. There was only a, a branch surgery um, of a neighbouring practice with the main surgery quite far away. So um, I knew also that I had two small children who were going to go to school in the village, so I didn't really be travelling. But um, it really, we needed to find a suitable premises. And so we spent a long time looking because um, one of the most important things you need as a practice, I think, is a decent car park. Mm. So, it, it, yeah, we just, there were commercial units that came up, but they were just unsuitable for what we wanted it for. So we went, um, we looked actually at an undertaker's in a neighbouring village, which was quite spooky. Um, and then we, it wasn't really where we wanted to be, and we put an offer in, and it wasn't accepted, and we were all a bit, and I went off on holiday and got a, um, a phone call from my business partner saying you're not going to believe what's happened and um he'd just been googling as we did you know commercial property east league and he and a building that we'd said we'd we'd driven by and said i wish they put that on the market came onto the market no yeah yeah no. so um so he, so he said, like, I've got, I had to phone him tell you, and I said, that, I said you, you've got to buy it. You've just got to buy it. So before the for sale sign even went up on this building, um, we'd, we'd bought it, basically. Mm. Perfect. It's on a road. It's got a car park and a yard. Um, it's a really good space. Good. And uh, so then after that, you set up the practice when you were actually, when you know, getting into law, setting up practice, what challenges do you feel? I mean, uh, like a lot of people that are talking about setting up practices, not many people set up practices these days. They tend to buy no. or, or, you know, so explain a bit more about your own journey, setting up what challenges you, do you feel? Yeah, I think it's hard. And I always said I'd, I'd write a manual on how to do it because there isn't one. So I think you just start with this um, this blank building, especially if you've got to convert it, that you think, I mean, and it's bizarre because we've all worked in a number of veterinary practices, but you start this journey from scratch about, um, you know, what do we need? Um, how do we do it? And there was a, um, what, a new vet had just set up actually a, a large sort of corporate and had an open evening. So they, um, with the people that had set their place up. So we went and had a look and these people set up veterinary practices, um, but they were charging extortionate sums of, of money. So then that wasn't an option to us. Um, so we got in a, an architect friend um, who then visited a few practices, asked us for sort of workflow diagrams and things. Mm. With that, we came up with the basic sort of premise of how we wanted it. And then it was really finding, um, you know, builders and because a lot of the practice is when you strip it bare, it's just, um, you know, it's just units and furniture, isn't it? Mm. And they get the mm. expensive equipment in. So 
that you think you need lead walls. That was a thing, you know, you suddenly start the build, you say to the builders, well, this needs to be lead lined and they've never built a lead lined room before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was, it was a learning curve in terms of that, mm -hmm. trying to keep it in budget mm -hmm. um, and really just, I think, you know, knuckling down, finding what you really needed from, from day one without, we, I think we were quite sensible. Um, and our premises look fairly bare when we first opened up. Mm -hmm. But we, we've always been quite cautious. So we didn't open this brand spanking, all singing, dancing, back opened with what we needed. Um, and, and then over the years have, have sort of built on. Mm -hmm. Lucky that we had support from the vet school um, close by. We, we have a good relationship with them. So I think they were really interested that we could then use our experience to talk to students. So in return for doing that, they were very supportive and lent us some of the pieces of equipment and things. Mm. G, ultrasound, we didn't have our own until a couple of years down the line. Um, so that, yeah, that really helps. Yeah, so when, and after when the practice actually opened up, um, do you face any challenges? Like when customers started coming in, what were the challenges in the first six yeah, months? Yeah, so as soon as we bought the building, we put up a, um, a big banner on the side of the practice saying um, Pinfold Vets coming soon. And apparently it was the talk of Meadow Park, our local dog walking park. And then when the builders were on site, um, towards the end, then Rupert and I were setting up, we had our, you know, vet IT system in, we were, we were there in the day, sort of getting everything organized and people gradually started coming in and we'd, we'd, um, we did a leaflet drop and then we had phone calls. And so when we opened, we probably had 10 clients registered or something who would come before. Um, but then I remember opening and you just wait, for the phone to ring in the first person to come and it does but then i remember three weeks in we had this day where the phone didn't ring it was absolutely dead and i just thought this what a, this is a disaster so um so i was going to have a half day anyway it was pointless as both being there um so i came away and um and went off to do the supermarket shop rang my friend who um has only practiced for many many years and said the phones aren't ringing what have I done? And he said, no, it'll be fine. It will be absolutely fine. So I was all distraught, wondering what on earth, I'd, what a big mistake I'd made. And then got back home, spoke to Rupert, my business partner. He said, we've been run off our feet all afternoon. <laughs> amazing, amazing. So yeah. uh, share with us a little bit, like when you started, so it was yourself and your uh, partner, who is also a vet, your business partner is also a vet. Um, yeah. How many other personnel did you have? Um, we had two receptionists who were part-time, so that made it for one full-time. Mm. Full-time head nurse and two part-time nurses. Mm. Yeah. Well, we might have had... No, I think we had just two nurses at the beginning, but I think we had another one literally started after three or month, four months. So we'd taken her on, but we knew that we probably didn't need her from the beginning. So we just had that. So we have, we've always been quite cautiously um, staffed. Because that, that is also quite a lot of uh, salaries to pay for. The phone's not yeah. ringing and nobody coming in at all. So I that... know, I know. And especially the good thing is the vets who are, you know, we're the, we're the, the costly bit. We obviously work for free for a few months till we got there. And it was hard. The first year, Rupert and I did the whole lot between us. We worked one in two weekends. We had Saturday and Sunday. Um, you know, it was hard. But again, we, we did have some people... Um, some friends of ours that vets would do the odd Sunday for us so we could have some and, um, and, and also because it wasn't busy mm. it wasn't that stressful when you know, there was a lot to do but mm. uh, you know come the evening it was relatively quiet so one of us would go um, so I think that's how I managed to have two small children and work mm. it wasn't that demanding when I was in work where um, it's bonkers and if you're in work you're in work and you're focused on work and there's not mm. time to do much else fair enough if you had three pieces of advice for anybody thinking of setting up what would they be sorry three you broke up a bit three pieces of advice for setting up if somebody says i want to set up a practice and come lorna what advice would you give me what sort of three pieces of advice would you give so the first piece would be do it. I think, you know, if, you, if you've got that inkling, 
now is such a good time. I think, you know, as an independent practice, we can just offer so much more the corporates can't. And I just think it's a, it's a great thing to do. And if you want to, um, you know, be in charge of your own destiny to a certain degree, work how you want to work, then I would, my first piece of advice would be don't look back. If, you, if you've got that inkling, then just go ahead and do it. Um, my second one would be to, um, you know, don't be afraid to ask. I think really, um, I'm... Uh, we know just from CPD trips and things like that, we know quite a lot of vets who have had their own practices for years and years and years, and their input was absolutely invaluable for setting up. And um, and I think, and they were really helpful and supportive. And I think if you, you know, if you don't reach out and ask for that sort of help, that then everyone thinks you're right and don't come forward. But I think you do need those people to help you and just to say, you know, what are we expecting here? What should I do? Have you tried this and all that? Um, and the second, and the second, the third thing, sorry, that's two. The third thing I think is be quite clear what you're trying to achieve. Um, we set out from the beginning when I first approached um, Rupert to say, did he want to do it? We first talked about the sort of practice that we wanted to be. And, um, and we both were in agreement. We were a very community-based practice. We provide really good quality, but quite pragmatic approach to treatment. Mm -hmm. um, but we very much want to be part of the, of the community and cater for, for a quite diverse range of people in the village. And that's what we do. But, but you can, you know, as vets, we can be different things. So you have to really be quite clear in your mind what you're, gonna, what you're going to try and do and who you target or is and and who you want coming into your practice and, and and branding i think comes into that and um so yeah i'd say have a strong brand identity if you like and a clear plan of where you're going okay and um because in vet college you know what we study is actually a lot of it is based on you know diagnosis treatment so to speak i still mm -hmm. remember my first day in college where the professor was saying that a lot of our sort of um, problems in the future will be 80% human, 20% animal, so to speak. Mm. But interestingly, in my experience, in my opinion, the entire vet college was more 80% animals, 20% human, if even. So what are your thoughts about this particular uh, experience that I had? Do, do you feel the same way? Well, so in college, they said it would be 80% human, 20% animals. The problems come 80% human, 80% yeah. from animals. But what they taught us was 80% animal, 20% yeah. human, if even. How yeah. did you know that prepared you for working life? Um, I think it did. I mean, as I say, I, I think it helped that I'd done other jobs. So it's always worked and done, um, you know, lots of customer service roles, I think, um, you know, that probably gave me sort of confidence and also an expectation of what working life is like. Um, so, I, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. What about, what about business? Do you think college would have helped you in setting my own business? Yeah, I mean, the degree I did before, I did some business, some basic business modules. So I think that probably helped me without even, you know, without being sort of too aware. I think the trouble is, is there's so much in the vet course that it, it becomes very difficult mm. to business that you need to know. Mm. And also, I really, realistically, you need a few years in practice under your belt before you can, mm. I think. I don't think it's impossible, but I think it'd be a very brave person to mm. come out and do it because you know at least by the time we set up we kind of could deal with the day-to-day -day without it stressing us too much the clinic mm -hmm. um you know because then we have the stress of running something so i don't think there's huge amounts to be said for doing loads at college because i think by the time you use it um it would you know it wouldn't um it, yeah, you'd probably forgotten a lot of it, but I think they are a lot better now, certainly looking at the curriculum at Nottingham about teaching um, communication skills and things like that. Because mm. um, I think that's important. And I, I would say, you know, even the, it becomes 80% people, 20% pets. To me, I think the balance is 50-50. I think I spend a lot of time treating my patients and actually, um, yes, it, they come with owners, but I... You know, I've made some great friends through the practice and I think people are really interesting and um, and I get a lot out of my job from the people that I work with. And I think the other thing is that things have happened to me throughout my life and 
um and that again it's that experience that you never you know you never know what other people are um other people are, is going on in their lives and some of the most challenging things i've had can actually sometimes be the most satisfying to sort out and sometimes you can end up with you know you can think you've got a really angry awkward person that you're trying to deal with but actually when you dig deeper they're actually very upset about something and you've helped them and they can be immensely grateful so i think it's um you know it's kind of 50 50 i think okay and um so we have both qualified for 15 16 years now um what do you think has changed in the profession since we qualified more than a decade ago um i think that um i think that we um I think it's tight the profession's tightened up in that I think it's better for working out you know an expectation of work life balance and things um is a is a lot better. I think out of hours has changed I mean when we came out, we all expected to do it vets and hours in its mm. early days um so you know we don't do out of hours anymore. I think there's a greater expectation placed on us. Um, and I think far more people have pets. Um, so from sort of all what, people that aren't particularly sort of animal people, every, you know, lots of people have pets. Um, and also there is more, I think with the rise of the corporate practice, which I don't think is a bad thing. I think that's, you know, that's fine. And I think what that's probably made a lot of independents do is tighten up on the business side and the, the, the um, HR side, which they should have done. Um, with the rise of those, I think it's made us much more sort of commodity driven and practice ha practices have to be business minded. You know, mm. I think when we qualified, there was still the odd practice around where the money got shoved in the partner's pocket at the end of the day, counted later, and you know, a bit of a mo uh, I don't know, it was just it was a bit more James Herriot like. Mm. We it's it, we're not we're not like that anymore it's we've tightened up you've got to be savvy you've got to run your practice you've got to be aware that um you know and that's one thing i love about having your own practice is we can be really ethically and welfare minded and do things properly and how we want to and how it sits comfortably with us but there has to be a business plan underneath because you've got to you've got to pay staff you've got to keep those facilities going you've got to make sure your practice looks nice and um and it's a safe and pleasant working environment for your staff and customers. Okay. Uh, yeah, I totally agree with you on that. that that's uh, what one reason why I sort of have my own practice really, so we can sort of depict the standards and welfare level and the care that we're going to give to yeah. our animals and the customers as well. Um, I'd like to ask you this, uh, something about, so you know, we, we had recent statistics in you know, SPIFs last year, they said, how the dropout rate is quite high in the vet profession at 38 yeah. percent more than a third of vets would quit the job if they could afford it and also the depression rate is also quite high you know vet life which is the 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 vet version of uh, the samaritan phone calls they report a very very high uptake on phone calls in the recent mm. years as well and also we are also known to have quite a high suicide rate in the profession whereby we are twice more likely to uh, end our lives uh, than the medical profession and four times more likely than the general public. Mm. So two questions really, I would like your perspective. Why do you think there is such statistics in this particular profession? And do you personally know anybody uh, that has, you know, uh, involved in those sort of uh, situations? Well, I think, that, I mean, to me, I don't worry too much about the dropout because when you look at the numbers graduating, you know, there's more people coming in. And I think there's been a massive sway towards um, more the feminization of the profession. Mm. And to me, you know, there's, there's not many, um, you know, a lot of women do want to have families and stop work or work part time. And that's, that's fine. Mm. Um, that means that we will have a higher higher dropout because um, there there will be career breaks. There will be people that decide that they want to leave and and um, stay at home. So, and, and I think nowadays it's a lot more common to have a couple of careers. Mm. So you know you look at other you look at um, you know other people and other and other um, careers and our longevity. You know we're living longer. There's greater opportunities. We're generally better off. So I think there's more choice available to us. So some of it, I agree, is the sort of stresses and strains of the profession. But I think the trouble is, is that um, once you 
get over if you can if you know if you can get over sort of 10 years you suddenly find that actually it's a it's a lot nicer than it it was before because life just is easier mm-hmm. um yeah and i think there's lots of reasons why um there people drop out but i do think that practices are generally you know we know we've got to is it is it at the moment it, you know it's been it's certainly been an employee's market and we know that we have to look after our vets so i think there is a big sway toward um you know towards looking after our vets and as for you know depression and suicide um it does get me down that i you know we're continuously being told that we have the highest suicide rate and and um you know, men, the sort of mental health issues. And I think if you look at teaching or any of the professions, they're, you know, they, they all say the same, but there's probably more calls to vet helplines because we're a lot more, you know, mental health, we talk about it now. I mean, we didn't mm-hmm. even go back and seeing how the university sort of chaplain system and pastoral care runs now. It's quite different from even when we were at uni. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know we're all talking about it and actually if you talk to your clients Mm. mental health issues are out there as well so Mm. you know i completely am with the be kind um i think you know we should be kind but i think one thing i feel really strongly about is that we also have to we you know clients come pay to come in and see us Mm. so sometimes we put up with a bit of stick but we're dealing with upset people that are a bit on the edge and and you never quite yeah i there is all this all be kind to your vets well we should all be kind to each other we've got to be kind to the person on the other side of the table and you know, i don't they are coming to see me they need me and if i've had a got something else going on then if we're just all nice to each other it doesn't really you know it all sort of be out does that make sense i waffled a bit there yeah yeah, yeah. no no, no. It, it it does i i think uh I, I think my perspective also is uh, not many people, they know how to be kind to themselves. No, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Not, yeah. I mean, I, so yeah, and I think we, and to a certain degree as well, I think it's, um, we're all in charge of our own happiness and, um, and well-being. And I think that's something it's very easy to look around. So it is, you know, because of my job or actually, and I do pack a, a lot into my life. So when I'm not working, I'm doing quite different things creative things sports things but to me that um and sometimes i do run myself pretty close to the edge i know when i'm um you know too stressed or feeling run down that's when it's really important to um to then do something different and it's not because i'm a vet i think i'm like that i'm like that because of um because some that's the sort of person i am and even whatever i was doing i think sometimes it's really it's so easy to look at our profession and say well it's difficult and we've got you know this that and the other but we're all really lucky and then we've got a variable job that's, that's paid um you know that gives us financial security um there's a lot of positives to being a vet as well and i i love my career and i, w- I wouldn't swap it and i think there's an awful lot of people that are really envious of the careers that, and the opportunities that we've got mm. um how do you see how do you see the future of veterinary medicine? A lot has changed, seems like you mentioned James Harriet when we qualified yeah. like, just only 15 years ago. How do you see it projecting in, say, in 10 years' time? What does it look like? Well, it's, it's been interesting. I mean, I think I don't get too excited about the corporates. I think that'll, that'll settle out and there'll be a, you know, they'll get to a certain market saturation, but independence will always exist. We've seen it happen in, you know, in other industries and things. So, um, and I think, um, Oh, I just need to plug my computer in. Hold on. This is great, by the way, Lorna. Thanks a lot. Okay. Do you want me to start this question again? Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, I, I can uh, ask the question again. Hang on, then. I just, I just moved the gerbils. Perfect. <laughs> Is that okay? Yeah. Just slightly, but I'm sure no one will notice. Yeah, that's right. Uh, your background is a bit too bright, making. Uh, yeah, that's, that's much better. Can, that's much better. Yeah, I'll see if I can. Um, as long as it's not facing the window, it's much better. Yeah, hang on. We've got, we're having a load of building work done, so the, um, so the plugs don't quite read. 
working. Let me see if I can get to the table. I should be able to make sure the children don't come out and crush it. Uh -oh. Hello. Good. Yeah, so we're talking yeah. about how, how do you see the future of uh, yeah. Green medicine? Yeah. So I think, I mean, I don't see any huge threat with the corporates and things. I think it'll even out. So they'll get to a certain market saturation, but independence will always um, exist. And I think we can provide something that they can't. Um, I think um, with the feminization of the profession, I think um, there'll be more people wanting flexible and part-time roles. Mm. So I think, you know, there's a place, what we have in the future, I think will we'll serve a purpose for, for everybody. I think it also, with the corporates, I think there's um, more room to sort of go up in managerial roles without owning your own practice. So I think for us, we very much became, well, probably the generation before. So you became a vet, you were an assistant vet, and then you became a partner or, a, you know, an owner. That was that whereas certainly I was climbing quite a nice managerial ladder and my career was progressing without going into practice ownership and um, some people want to carry on and progress their career but don't want to be an owner mm. so I think there's more opportunity with corporates to do um, to do that so um, yeah it'll change I think there'll be more um, flexible work and I think people are a lot more of using out of hours services just because that's the norm now so I think that gives us better work-life balance sort of immediately one thing that I think has been quite interesting with COVID is um, there was a lot of talk before COVID about um, telemedicine and the threat of telemedicine to practices and obviously then the restrictions the lockdown happened so we um, were reliant on telephone consultations and we were trialing a video platform for a bit um, and actually for me for us personally I don't see telemedicine as that much of a threat because I think um, you know our clients are desperate to come back and you're so limited in what you can do on the phone or a video you know in the in the end we, we rarely use video consultations we did a bit phone stuff but it was quicker just to get people down because you know I think in probably as a GP it works better because you can but you, we're so reliant in our clinical exam aren't we um, and a history from you know history from an owner but we, you can't ask the dog or cat so I think that's um, everyone says you know the future is in telemedicine and mm. I, I, I can I can appreciate that I had to do one consult by telemedicine and uh, to check a dog's eye and 15 minutes the owner was running around trying to get a phone to the dog's eye so that was a bit pointless so I can appreciate that. Um, what about the vet medicine itself? So so far we're talking about business uh, things, corporates, you know, flexible hours, feminization. Yeah. What about the medicine itself? How do you think the future of medicine looks like? But I think it's I think it's advancing and it's great. I mean, it amazes me what can be now certainly you know the referral centers what we can um you know we can send stuff stuff away for but I, I still think um first opinion a lot of people just want good first opinion care and even if it's insured or they can um you know they've got the opportunity or they can afford to i think there's still a great way that wants to you know that into it I, I think there is always that question of just because you can do something should you and i don't think that's um you know i don't think that's going to go away mm. um the referral centers are fantastic but i'm always amazed when we give people the choice of having something done um elsewhere by a specialist or us in hand mm. even though you know it's fully insured or whatever mm. i think what people want for their pets is to be with them and know who they're with um, so yeah I'm amazed at the people that say no I know you and I want to stay with you and um, and yeah I know that I could go and have this done but actually I'll go for this because I don't want to be away from my pet and I don't want to leave it somewhere that you know I don't know um, yeah, that's 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 a very good point I mean um, and comparing you know we're talking about 
20 years ago where specialism isn't as much and there were plenty, there were more mixed vets around. Yeah. Uh, you know, when we qualified, there were more, there were referral centers and now there's just more and more referral centers and more and more specialization of the profession itself into each topic. People seem to be learning, when I say people are, like vets seems to be learning more and more about less and less. Pushing that even further, do you yeah, see that think... even getting more? Because right now, you know, most of us are comfortable to say, I'm, I'm comfortable to say that I'm probably going to be a terrible mixed vet because the amount of knowledge there is for farm animals, equine and small animals is just too much. Mm. And I'm going to pick one. So that's me talking about, and 20 years ago, it was perfectly comfortable to become a mixed vet. So pushing 10, 20 years from now, do you think that progression is just going to go wherever it gets specialized, specialists even more and more? Or do you think yeah, they I mean, I think, to... I think the mixed vet's dying out without a doubt. And I don't necessarily think that's, you know, that's a bad thing. Um, came out in a mixed job and very quickly your skills develop in what you're doing most of the time. And then mm. you're able to be a bloated cow in the middle of the night and feel completely out of your depth. Mm. So, um, and and they simply can't teach it. And also the other thing is with, um, you know, I mean, this this just topic goes just so broad because it then ties in with farming and and, it, and um, food production. So we're looking much more intensive um, livestock production, and um, and then you know you've also got your your sort of hobby farmers and things. But because now with these huge herds and flocks and things. Herb medicine is just completely different from individual medicine. So, and, and I think that's where the universities will probably end up going because actually, if you're looking at doing cows and sheep and livestock production and and, um, and looking after farm animals, you you know you need to know about epidemiology of mm -hmm. flocks and groups of animals rather than what we need to know about, which is how to treat an individual. So. Um, yeah, I do think it will be a thing of the past. I mean, there's a lot of crossover. So, you know, I could probably do surgery on a cow or a sheep, you know, because I've got the cutting skills and things, but um, I couldn't go out to a farmer and tell him what to do, you know, how to improve the incident, you know, decrease the incidence of foot rot in his herd. I, I know how to do that now well, no, yeah well same here so <laughs> you know it's, uh, I, I can totally appreciate that um, i'd like to ask you this question there are two parts to this question and uh, we're quite lucky that you have been through both parts not many do one is that the question is uh, do you think vet medicine is profitable so the two parts to it is one as a salaried vet as an employee and two as a business owner like yourself so uh, what you say, if you you know and i don't I don't like to use the term profitable too much because I don't, you know, certainly I don't want people thinking that I sit there rubbing my hands with glee at the end of a day, you know, just, you know, doing it all for a fast buck because it's not like that. And clients know that. I think there's nothing wrong with working hard and being able to earn a decent living um, from doing something that you love and doing it to with you know honesty and integrity and to the best of your ability um and getting rewarded for that and actually for what we can do then yes i think a small animal veterinary practice is, is a is a very good business model if it's run properly i think it would be very hard to make that business model fail just because of um the demand for our services i think as graduates there's always this big thing that they're not paid enough um, but I, I think we look at it the wrong way if you look in um, at the other statistics veterinary graduates are in the top three of, um, in, of, of in finding employment straight off from university and also in salaries as well um, or in the top five or something like that so I think you know everyone comes out feeling a bit disgruntled but I think we've got to realize that as graduates we're, we're really lucky most of us come out and find jobs pretty much straight away mm. um, and and your salary goes up quite quickly and that's kind of expected now um so and it, i think what happens is probably for your first 10 years mm. you're going up this salary scale as you as you 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 get more skilled and you can do more things and then it kind of stops and i think that's where that frustration is mm. where you've got to bite the bullet and set up on your own um, or you've got to find some sort of specialism to create 
greater sense of worth to the practice that you're in. And if you don't do either of those things, you probably are stuck at a certain level. But, you know, that's kind of, you know, when you look at what specialists are now, I mean, that's, that's amazing. They'll, they'll, they'll be taking home more than most practice owners without the responsibility of having a practice every day. So, and to me, I earned more in my first job than both my parents combined income together. Um, so I've always thought that we've been relatively well paid mm. for what we do. And I think it's very hard to compare against other professions and what they do because there's a market rate. We can't suddenly say that, um, you know, vets should be paid twice what they're paid because that income has got to come from somewhere mm. and market rate for setting fees. You know, we just decide that we're going to, um, yeah, you, there's, there's a market rate and there's a rate what people expect to pay and are happy with paying. Do you do you have um, pet owners saying that, ooh, you must be, uh, you are a vet, you must be rolling it in? Um, so most of ours, I think that's going a bit now. I, I do think that's going a bit now because I think the, the um, I think there's a lot of people doing, you know, more people I think are setting up businesses. There's a lot of people that are in property that are doing quite well. Um, I live in the village, so people see the car I drive, they see the house I live in. But what one thing they do see is how hard I work. And I think that anyone that knows me, that sees me on the school run, dashing up to drop the children off, dashing back to the practice, that comes into the practice on a Sunday and still sees me there. Mm. That's the great thing is that I don't think people have any qualms. That, yeah, you know, I make a, a, a good living from pinball. I'm proud of that. But hell, I put the work in and, mm. um, you know, that's, yeah. and people pay, I think we, what we offer at Pinfold is good value for money, excellent value for money, I'd say. Um, mm. People don't, don't mind that because I think they see how hard we work. I, I, I believe you just uh, knocked it on the head by saying it's, uh, you know, good value for money, excellent value for money because I think mm. people are always looking for the value and as long as yeah. you have the value, that's a key thing really. Yeah. Uh, it sounds as though you know you have really enjoyed your whole career. So I'd like to ask you this very simple question: um, How do you feel about being a vet? And before you answer that, you know the reason why I ask this question is because of like like I just said, you know there are sort of people having depression, suicide, uh, attrition, uh, you know, dropout rates. But you know you clearly look as though you are reveling in this particular profession. So I'd like to have your take on. You know, Lorna, when you say that I'm a vet, how, how do you feel saying that I'm a vet? Really proud, I think. And um, yeah, really proud. And I honestly could not imagine doing anything else. And that's not because, and believe you me, I have a lot of interests and I, you know, and a, 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 a lot of things, but I honestly can't see myself doing another job. It's me, it, it's part of me, you know, it's what I do. And I think when, I set up Pinfold and I do, you know, my own social media and stuff. That's that was all what I had in my head, and and it's just it's part of my identity. I'm, you know, I'm a mother, I'm a, a wife, um, I'm an open water swimmer, um, you know, I enjoy cycle running, but I'm all, a big lump of me is also Pinfold, and I still have day, you know, I have days where I'd rather be at home than at work. I have days where it's very stressful. Um, I even have the odd day where I tell my husband I'm going to sell the practice. Overall, um, I smile uh, about it and I'm, and I'm immensely proud of it. And it's something that I couldn't, I'm so glad I've done. And, um, and I know that I've never looked back and wished that I'd done something else. And all the years it took to get there and student loans and living in London in you know, houses miles away from uni and all that and staying and seeing practice and all that stuff. It's all been... Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm immensely proud to say I'm a vet and I'm proud to say I'm happy as well. What advice would you have for someone who, can, who says that I want to be a vet and uh, asks you, Lorna, can you give me any, any advice? I want to be a vet. And uh, what, what, what would you say to him or her? Well, Lennon, I'd say that I need to read my book that's coming out later this year, hopefully, or early next year about being a vet. <laughs> and also just to, um, I'd say, well, I said they want to do it, do it. But I think I think the thing to do is make sure that they're doing it for the right reasons. And I think we're now seeing that actually these really sort of high, you don't need to be a high-flying academic 
to be a vet. You need to, um, you know, you need to be a people person. You need and and have an expect. Make sure that they know what the job is like. And I think that there were so many people that assume that being a vet is quite different um, to to how it is day to day. But the other great thing about being a vet in this day and age is the opportunities open to us. You know, is phenomenal. I've gone into small animal practice ownership. That's a fairly mundane route, but you know, I've got people, my, um, someone a few years behind us is the vet at Columbus Zoo. Um, you know, we've got, there's fish medicine, there's education, um, there's, there's pharmaceutical companies, you know, it, being a vet is not, it's not what, it's not all cats and dogs or cows and sheep. Mm -hmm. Just so much more. So I'd say you know, do it, but um, manage your, you know, think about why you want to do it, and also think about what's involved. But you should do that with any career that you choose to go into, anyway. What's the name of your book? Um, to vet school and beyond. Okay, to vet school and beyond. Make sure yeah. you get it. This is a by you know Lorna Owen Jones. It's a great book. You know, make sure you get the book. Be Lorna, I'm Lorna Clark now. I'm the Lorna Clark. So under yeah. Lord, Dr. Lord. But I, when it comes out, when it comes out, because it's been delayed, um, it, it's gone off, it's still being illustrated, but um, when it comes out, I should let you know so you can um, tell people yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I, ho I just hope it's not, I just, I was asked if I wanted to do it. I'm really passionate about what I do. It's been like you interviewing me today. I spoke to a lot of vets in really different um, spheres and was absolutely fascinating, quite jealous sometimes about the routes that they'd gone down. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I'm incredibly proud to be part of what I still think is a really good profession that has good bits, bad bits and mediocre bits. Amazing. Final question. If you had a chance to go back in time and see, uh, and see your younger self in your 20s, what advice would you give her so to be able to uh, skip or to um, not have so much uh, trouble or challenges that you've faced throughout the years since then? I don't, well, I don't think I'd want to skip the trouble and the challenges because I think they make you who you are. So much as there's a massive adversity to going through life, I think if you just, you know, I think you've got to go through those bits to make you appreciate what you've got. And if I'd sort of come this far and had just sailed through on this journey, I think I'd probably be a bit smug and I'm not sure I'd be... A, particularly nice person because I'd just be sat here wondering why it was so easy and why you know everybody just wasn't doing this so I think what I'd probably say is don't to myself would be don't be too hard on myself and also that it will all be all right I think they're the only two things is that I still think you've got to go through the trials and tribulations and um you know, I wouldn't want to bypass those because I think they make you the person that you are. And I also think going through that really helps you relate to other people. Um, but yeah, I think I'd say just, you know, don't sweat it and it will all be, you know, and generally everything turns out all right in the end. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Lorna, for sharing really with great, us the Leonard. journey, your experience. There's so much value over there. For those interested to be a vet, make sure you listen to this again. This is a vet. This is my, my, my friend. Uh, you know, college mates, we went through college together, went through normal working, a normal working life as an employee, then oh, finally well. set up on, the, on her own uh, as a business uh, owner with a vet practice that is uh, thriving very, very well and has also written a book. So thank you very much, Lorna, for that. No worries. Thanks a lot.